Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to this session for the hour, um, which is about uh, resources, natural resources, and the um, increasing demand and need for natural resources for the growing economy, particularly in this part of the world. This is an issue which, um, as you've probably noticed as you've gone through several discussions here in Dalian at our annual meeting of new champions and elsewhere, that um, the debate that uh, we've been part of and uh, are helping to uh, host has moved us, if you like, from a purely carbon challenge perhaps into other areas of food, broader energy access issues, water, uh, um, other natural resources, earth metals, etc., etc. So our discussion today is about um, uh, resources and the demand, increasing demand for business and other users for those resources. I'm delighted to welcome our host to guide us through these discussions, Andrew Stevens of the CNN, and he will introduce the panel to you and lead us through this conversation. My name is Dominic Warre. I'm a senior director in charge of environmental uh, and sustainability activities here at the Forum. I hope you enjoy the discussion, and we look forward to a good debate. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, session, the resource discourse. Um, very, very timely, and one thing I've noticed about uh, this uh, World Economic Forum is the increasing amount of time that has been now being given to the resource issue, to how to uh, manage resources, global resources, as Dominic was saying, this is not just an energy story, as we all know. This is a water story. This is a food story. And the three are obviously very closely interlinked. Anyway, um, just a couple of figures I just wanted to throw out there. You would be familiar with, with many of these. And they do vary slightly, but they're all pointing to <clears throat> very much uh, the same theme. Looking at what this globe is going to look like in 2030, 20 years from now, uh, as far as consumption and demand is concerned, there'll be about 8.3 billion of us on the planet. Now, some of the numbers I've come up with is that demand for food will have increased by some 50% in 2030, water by 30%, oil by 25%. All this, of course, against a backdrop of climate change, more and more extreme weather events are happening before our eyes. There's very rarely a week that goes past, as I read the news on CNN, that there is not a drought story or a flood story or an extreme storm story somewhere in some part of the world. So joining us now to look at this issue and how companies, how businesses actually manage, how do they prepare their strategy for dealing with more demand, more people and dwindling resources? Very distinguished panel we do have today as well. I'd like to thank everybody for joining me up on the stage today. And just to my immediate left, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mr. Shi Ding Huan. He is a councillor for the State Council uh, of, the, uh, of the People's Republic of China. He uh, has been uh, a very instrumental figure in developing the latest five-year plan. He's also been an instrumental figure in renewable resources and policies for renewable resources here in China. Now next to Mr. Xi is a gentleman who many of you may know, Richard O'Brien. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Newmont Mining, which of course is the world's now biggest gold producer, also a significant copper producer as well. Uh, on uh, Richard's left, we're joined by Wu Changhua. She is the, great, uh, she's the Director for Greater China of the Climate Group, and this is a, a group that uh, looks at public-private partnerships in, uh, in renewable resources, in particularly uh, dealing and achieving low emission growth. Uh, next to uh, Chang Hua, we have uh, Scott Thompson. And Scott is the CFO of Talisman Energy, which is a, uh, an energy company based in Canada, diversified upstream oil and gas group, uh, operates in North America, the North Sea, and also here in Asia. And next to Richard, Mohammed Jafar. Mohammed is the chairman of the Kuwait Danish Dairy Company, now KDD is a leading manufacturer and distributor of food and beverage products in the Arabian Gulf. And one question I will put to uh, Mohammed is, uh, how does one produce milk in the desert in the quantities that they are doing it? So with that, I'd like to start, Richard, if I can, with you. Uh, because I know 
At this conference, you and your peers have been meeting at the Mining and Metals Institute group. Now, this is obviously a group of peers. You are looking at strategies of dealing with use of resources, production of resources. What was the feeling there about sort of the world in 30 years and how it's going to look and how you're going to deal with it? Broad question to begin. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, good question though, and I think uh, at the resource summit, this is the third resource summit that the, uh, the, the Board of Governors has sponsored here. Um, and that resource summit, we covered a couple of things, so let me just, a uh, couple of quick points. First, uh, we were asked a brief question yesterday, which is, uh, do we think that resource nationalization is going to occur in the near future? And amongst a group of about 20 people, the unanimous answer was yes. The next question was, do we think that's a good thing? The unanimous answer was no. So the growing burden on the world for development, production, and consumption of resources, I think is really going to put to test a number of relationships that we have around the world. And so the great thing about the World Economic Forum is if there's a problem, we're going to try to figure out what the solution is. And as mining companies, we're no different. Give us a hill, we'll figure out how to take it down. That's what we do. Um, but I think as we approach that, what, one of the things that we really are focused on is something that we, we look at, which is the resource uh, development initiative. So we have a responsible mining development initiative that we're actually sponsoring around the world. And what's that about? It's about trying to create an atmosphere where we can bring more production on in association with communities and governments in transparent ways so that we can actually meet the needs of the world through mining by actually working forward transparently and with communities so that these mines are actually sustainable. So moving from mining curse to mining benefit. And I think without that engagement, that kind of engagement, I think that we'll be unable as miners to really meet the resource needs that we have around the world. So how do we do it sustainably and responsibly? And I would just say for those who are interested, we have actually have a set of some of the work that we've done back both in Chinese and in English in the back on the left-hand side as you go out. Uh, we have a couple of uh, brochures that we've put together. We're actually trying to solve the problem here, not just create the problem. And I think that that's part of what our initiative is about. And I think it's terrific that we have a group of mining companies involved in this kind of forum where we're actually trying to work those problems. So uh, again, I think it's about access. It's about ensuring that governments don't feel the need to actually take assets back and nationalize them, but to actually put them into production in the best way possible. So taking preemptive action, in other words, about in involving more stakeholders, the local communities. Uh, this is, you're a listed company. What do you think that is going to mean for, earn, for profits for shareholders? Because that's what drives a lot of mining companies at the moment. Yeah, great question, Andrew. What I would say is uh, stocks are valued partly on profits and partly on discount rates. So what are the two things you have to work? Drive profits up, reduce discount rates. So is there going to be an impact in terms of addressing these issues financially? Absolutely. There will be a cost. But I think the benefit comes in the form of a lower discount rate because people don't have to associate political risk and the outcomes that we don't like, mine stoppages, employees who are dissatisfied, communities who protest. We actually have a lower discount rate that we can apply to our, our stream of cash flow because we don't have to worry about those vagaries. So I think that's the positive. Just a very quick one, Richard. Is there enough resources on this planet. What, as uh, Mohammed said to me earlier, that uh, one of the quotes from the World Economic Forum was, if everybody's going to start consuming like, uh, like uh, Americans and Europeans consume, that, following that consumption model, in 20 years' time, we're going to need three planets to, to produce it all. Yeah, I, I think that's a difficult question, but I'd answer it this way, which is, uh, I think it's, it, we have amazing innovation taking place in the world every day. We have amazing, I think, ideas around the world. And we have a stick to particularly in this industry, that we will figure out a way to resolve it. So I would say, can we meet the needs? Yes. What's the impact of that? 
prices are going to go up at some point. But our goal, I think, is to try to hit that mechanism of the market so that we do that right, so that people can anticipate that, they can react to it, and then to the extent that they choose to reduce their consumption by consuming less energy, I think that's where the parallel will come in. So we're all going to have to work to meet the needs, but I believe that we can find the resources. It's going to be difficult as if we don't overcome with technology and innovation on what we do today. I don't see enough resources to satisfy the world. I just have an optimism that I think there are other things that we'll accomplish that we just don't know today. That's an optimism that's been shared by Scott Thompson because uh, we were speaking about this and innovation in particular, Scott. Uh, Talisman is a big gas producer. Just tell us the story of innovation in your experience? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with, with Richard. I think there's a resource scarcity issue, uh, especially as you look at food, water, energy. Um, however, what I would say is um, I think you're seeing innovation um, you know, throughout the world, and in, in, particularly in the energy sector. So if we look at North America, for example, over the last five years, I think in the last two decades, uh, we thought there was about 1,000 trillion cubic feet of gas. Uh, and that's pretty, been pretty consistent over the last two decades. In the last five years, that's been up to 3,000 to 4,000 trillion cubic feet of gas in terms of resource because of innovation and the commercialization of shale gas. Um, five years ago, there was zero, zero natural gas production in, in North America was from shale gas. Today, it's about 25 percent. Uh, by 2020, it will be about 50 percent of natural gas consumption. Does that, does that increased uh, reserves then, is that easily enough to cover your projected demand? If, if those figures I quoted, that's a good point, those figures that I quoted would, would meet the needs of North America for the next 100 years. So from a gas perspective, North America has gone from chronically undersupplied or this discussion about scarcity to a situation where abundant supply, low prices, economic development, uh, and in fact thinking about uh, exporting gas off of North America. And I think this is, has huge implications, one for North America but also uh, for Asia. Because as you think about uh, the five-year plan that was just laid out and the um, movement away from coal to renewables or uh, more sustainability, movement away, less from greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, natural gas has a place. Um, Asia, and China in particular, has unconventional gas reserves. I mean, it's very well known that uh, those reserves could be developed here. So I think natural gas has a place in Asia. Um, and the discussion around scarcity may actually move to uh, one of uh, abundance from a national, natural gas perspective. Mm -hmm. Now. That's not the same uh, necessarily in water and food. And as we know, um, natural gas development takes a lot of water, and China doesn't necessarily, or Asia doesn't necessarily have a lot of water. So there's interlinkages between, um, between the different resources. I would say one other thing, too. Uh, innovation is one thing. Also, energy productivity is another thing. And I think we as Does a that society... Mean, is that the same as efficiency? Efficiency, productivity, efficiency. I think we as society will find ways to uh, do things better. So whether as it's saying, consuming yeah. less food, less leakage, whether it's through water, less le leakage through cities. I mean, there are lots of things that we will improve on over the next year. So I'm optimistic that um, although there's a scarcity issue, we will be able to deal with it. Well, and less consumption as well, would you say? And less consumption as well. So, so you're, really you're both saying that we, we will have to moderate our behaviour, our, our own consumption patterns. I'll ask both of you quickly, radically or moderately, do you think, to, to, to ensure an adequate supply for all? Difficult question. At this stage, you would say, it's a, it's a matter of just making sure you do sort of basic energy, sort of efficiency, turning lights off and things like that, or is it a bit more than that? Only one car, only... I, I'll go first. I think um, probably medium radically, and what do I mean by that? I don't think it's necessarily going back to... Uh, to no lights, you know, no consumption. I just don't see the world changing that way. But I do think it means that people need to pause and figure out what do I really need to do? How can I eliminate those inefficient things, whether it's at work or in my life, that really don't incrementally add to the value? So I do think that that has to change. And I think that kind of thinking happens through price mechanisms. So prices go up, people consume less. I think it also comes through communication and awareness. And I think those have to improve 
move radically, so price mechanisms around the world need to stabilize. Subsidies, I think, need to go away over time so that people get exposed to the real costs. And I think when that happens, then I think we're going to see more immediate response to price signals. Mm -hmm. And then I think the communication piece, I think we do need to talk to people about how long does it take to develop and what are costs going to look like if you don't choose alternative actions. Again, more visibility so people know what to expect. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think it will be moderately radical. That was a mm. perfect term. Um, you know, you think about 18 million cars per, per year in China um, mm. c coming onto, onto the roads. I mean, there's going to have to be some radical decisions um, in terms of energy efficiency um, in that front. Also in North America, in terms of move me, moving from uh, coal to natural gas for power generation. I mean, that takes policy, that takes uh, uh, forward thinking, that takes vision, and, and I think you'll have to see that throughout the world in order to, to meet the energy needs. Okay. Um, Mohammed, if I can turn to you. We, we've talked about energy, mining, food. Um, before we start, if you could just enlighten us how you do make milk in the desert? Right, thank you. Um, obviously you could, um, you could have farms and um, you could um, do it the traditional way or you could uh, grow orange groves to have uh, juice, but we don't, we don't do that. Um, we basically um, import the milk powder from New Zealand or Australia where there is plenty of water and recombine it uh, in Kuwait. Kuwait is one of the poorest nations when it comes uh, to water. Might be rich in oil, but you cannot drink oil and you cannot feed it to cows. So um, this touches on the issue of innovation and how do you deal with the scarce resources that you have. So if you don't have the resource, you obviously cannot uh, waste it. And you find innovative ways of feeding people in, uh, in remote areas that are cost effective and that also kind to the environment. But um, this drive, it was in the DNA of the model that we adapted. Um, I think increasingly as, you know, to use your example of the web's publication of the increasing uh, stress on the resources of the planet, uh, the, the prediction is that by 2030, if uh, consumers, the middle classes in China and in India consumed, demanded uh, what Europe demands today, that you'll need three globes. And if they consumed the way America consumed, it would be five globes. Now, we simply don't have today, with the current management practices, we don't have the water, we don't have the land that would supply uh, all this, this food. So where do you find it? And short of um, one, one, one point is if you, if you start managing your water resources, if you start economizing and optimizing on how much food you eat, how much waste there is, whether from the farm level or in storage or at home, even if whatever food is left in a hotel or after this conference, you send it to be recycled and turned into fuel. If you did all of that, would you, would you have the resources necessary to feed people? And we must remember that as we speak today, there is a crisis. There are people who go home hungry, and those are the farmers who are growing the food that we eat. So I think... Can, can I just interrupt? Yes. How do you, yourself, how do you prepare and, and to, to meet... You live in a, in, in a part of the world which is also rapidly growing, becoming wealthier, people are demanding more, population is rising. You have, as you point out, very scarce water resources. So how do you meet your projected demand for something which is obviously so water intensive? Well, um, the issue is that if, if you decide not as a country, as a nation, if you decide to rely on another nation for your crops, if you say, well, I don't have the water to grow wheat or to grow any food at all. I will rely on imports for that purpose. You're exposing yourself politically. Yeah. <laughs> because if there is a shortage in uh, oranges in uh, Brazil, or if the Indian government decides not to export basmati rice, and your people rely on wheat, 
then basically you've created yourself a nice problem. But uh, the, these are, if, if you don't do that, and if you go the route that Saudi Arabia, uh, my neighbor, followed, uh, Saudi Arabia grew, grew wheat for the longest time and exported it to Egypt. But they, they, I mean, for, for many countries, there, there's no alternative, is there? You have to import. Well, you, can't you can grow. Your... I mean, if you look at Holland, for example, today a lot of food that is sold in supermarkets across Europe is grown in greenhouses in Holland. Now, you look at the carbon footprint of that and you start thinking as a consumer, as um, a citizen, as a regulator, you say, well, uh, what is the footprint of importing that from Africa, um, creating jobs there, uh, compared to uh, the cost of fuel, the transportation, because that would be its carbon footprint, compared to saving on transportation and growing it uh, locally. Uh, I think consumers increasingly think that way, or um, they may not be able to crunch the mm. numbers that may not be readily available to them. But um, I think there's a general awareness that um, things cost, uh, in environmental terms, more than what you're paying for them. And I think this will be So the pricing the is wrong at the moment. We need to, you need, we're going to see a more realistic sort of form of pricing on food, do you think? Yes, but when, when the prices rose in, um, in Egypt a few years ago, there were riots and they had to call the, police, uh, the, the army to the streets and to run the, the, the ovens the, 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 you know, mm. to, to make bread. So it's easy to say that you know, the markets will regulate themselves and they will. However, um, there is a price, there is suffering that will come in the interim and um, that, that has to be taken into consideration, it has to be expected. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Shi, if I could turn to you. Uh, we, we've heard uh, private sector issues and, and how we could deal with scarcity issues. You've been involved in China's energy policy, if, if I can term it that. How, does it, how is the government, the Chinese government, dealing with the fact that you have an enormous population, not a lot of natural resources, and uh, increasing demand from a rising middle class. How do you frame your policy to meet all those different um, issues? China, like other countries, is facing severe uh, resource scarcity. With the increase of the population, uh, with the urbanization, especially accelerated urbanization. In terms of uh, water, mineral resources, uh, China uh, has seen a growing demand. Against this background, China has launched uh, energy efficient and resources conservation policy. We have made this policy our national policy in terms of energy. We have put forward the goal of energy conservation and emission reduction, and we have incorporated it into our overall social and economic development. In terms of water resources, we have aimed at increasing the efficiency of utilization. We have identified the policy goals and we have uh, uh, mapped out uh, some constraints on the local governments and the businesses. We have uh, break down the overall goals to uh, the businesses and the local governments. I want to emphasize that uh, against the background of uh, rising demand for resources. Uh, China consumption of uh, petroleum has been as high as 50 uh, percent. With the increase of the car ownership, the consumption of uh, petroleum in China will uh, further increase. In such circumstance, what should China do? China has uh, uh, turned its attention 
to renewable energy, including the wind power, solar power, biomass, and uh, uh, geothermal energy. Those energies are, are renewable. If we look at other countries' experience, those resources can satisfy the long-term needs of the humanity. In the past, we have a limited uh, technology to explore those resources. As a result, those resources uh, uh, failed to take uh, a big share in our energy consumption structure. However, in order to cope with the climate change and to address the energy scarcity issue, renewable energy has become a priority. Has become it has become a strategic uh, field. And with the advance of the technology, renewable energy um, can enter people's uh, life. Renewable energy can replace the fossil energy. I have been working in the uh, government for 30 years. I have witnessed uh, the involvement of China energy policy. In 1970s, after the oil crisis, uh, uh, the government uh, proposed uh, the development of renewable energy. Uh, however, due to the low pr price of uh, petroleum, the uh, renewable energy did not uh, develop lifts and bounds. However, in the new century, people uh, have already had a, a deeper understanding of climate change. It is inevitable. Uh, countries will shift to renewable energy. Uh, Chinese government has identified uh, the development of renewable energy a priority area. In the past decade, uh, the renewable energy has enjoyed uh, uh, remarkable progress. Uh, China has uh, developed uh, a legal framework and uh, a policy framework as well as favorable policies for the renewable energy. The cost of renewable energy has been cut uh, um, dramatically. Take uh, uh, solar uh, energy as an uh, example. The cost has uh, uh, reduced uh, from um, dozens of uh, yuan uh, per watt to 10 uh, yuan per watt. In the past, uh, the price of the um, on-grid um, was a 4 yuan. People still think the 4 yuan uh, was very expensive. Uh, the price has already uh, uh, been uh, reduced to 1 yuan. And now people think that uh, the on-grid uh, price of renewable energy of 1 yuan is acceptable. And uh, uh, it is the same case with the wind power. Um, so my point is that renewable energy can be uh, used uh, um, on a large scale in China. Are you saying that um, renewable energy is now commercially viable in China, or does it still need government subsidies to, to survive? Uh, currently, renewable energy has enjoyed uh, um, great development. However, uh, renewable energy still occupy a relatively low proportion. And Chinese government has proposed that renewable energy should take a share of 15%. I think uh, to achieve this goal, we need uh, the government policy. And also, we need to uh, boost the technology innovation to increase the competitiveness of the renewables. And from the long-term perspective, we believe that they will be able, we're able to provide the uh, renewables at the comparable price of the conventional sources. Uh, but the currently, we still need the support from the government. That is necessary support coming from the government. It is necessary. Uh, Chen Kua, can I just ask you then, we just heard 
政府主导的这个可替代的呃再生能源的策略，那么。呃，政府和私营部门的呃这个合作这个模式是是不仅仅在能源领域，而且在食品领域。现在能源需求会通过各种各样的创新来得以满足，通过更加小心谨慎的使用食品方面也是这样的一个问题。那么。你能不能谈谈中国在能源这方面，呃，和和在在跟跟食品一样投入同样的能源？那么这确实也取决。Parts of the world probably, you know, has different market situation, everything like that. In China, in particular, I think that has been the practice,、uh, has been the norm, and、uh, partly because actually, if you look at、uh, major resources, natural resources, as well as the energy sector,、uh, who are the biggest players from the business community? In most cases, they are state-owned companies. So, of course, you can claim state-owned companies;、uh, they are sort of a part of the government, whatever stuff like that. So, to large extent, you know, addressing The resources, food, water, energy—all the issues in China already. The public-private partnership is already in place. That has been playing a very, very important role there. And then the question, of course, is: Yes, we do have state-owned companies, but also we have a, a sort of increasing private sectors there as well.、Uh, are there, you know, good models, as, you know, too? Actually, you know, in those kind of strategic sectors, I think it's been sort of an evolving process. Evolving in a way, I think traditionally. Private sector,、uh, most cases, of course, in the beginning, their skill was limited, their capability was limited, so they they didn't really have a big role to play in those resource strategic sectors. Not in a major way, probably in some kind of niche kind of markets along the value chain, that sort of way. But gradually, over the last three decades or so, the private sector in China has been growing, has been really growing up very, very fast. And some of them already, actually, if you look at the size of those companies, revenues, everything like that, they are already regard. Regarded as large companies already, they are not state-owned. And in the meantime, actually, if you look at the government policy side from the public、uh, part, and、uh, because you know、uh, the the growing part of the private sector, because their expertise, their experience, because of the wealth, the capital accumulated in the private sector, and also more and more so now with the capital need actually、uh, for the strategic areas. So the government has started to relaxing sort of control over those strategic resource areas. Has started. To inviting, basically, those private sector capital into those strategic areas. So I feel confident. I think、And、it's, it's been it's, successful. They, they well, it de- again, actually, depending how you define it successful, I think it's a process,、mm. like step by step. This is just emerging, just starting now. It's hard to tell how successful that's going to be. I, don't, I haven't、mm. really done any systematic assessment at this moment, but it's encouraging to see that kind of trend, rather than see everything on the strategic resource areas controlled by state-owned companies actually. Private sector, private capital, more and more so, started to have a role to play.、Uh, one important element in there, say, why you need more private sector, private capital involved. I think it is a sort of innovation there. We all recognise actually, private sector happens to be really the innovation leaders that every economy needs, and that's. The area I would look forward to seeing actually more and more so reflected in the strategic resource areas. So you think PPI is the ideal model as opposed to all state or all private? Again, I say I think ideal.、Uh, the word itself is hard to define.、Mm. What do you mean? There's nothing perfect in this world. Everything is just to learn. You build up the partnership.、Uh, you know, work with each other.、Uh, maybe in the beginning, early stage, there are a lot of bumpers, stuff like that. You have to deal with. But、uh, gradually, I believe it's a must. It's not like we, you know, dealing with the issues we're talking about today. It's not just the government can solve the issue. It's not just the private sector or the business community can do it. It has to, like all the pieces, the government, the business, and also the public. We all have to come. To Together in order to solve the issue. Now, Richard O'Brien,、uh, having more government involvement in the U.S. is anathema to many people, as we're、uh, certainly hearing about.、Um, what do you think the U.S. could and should learn from China's approach to resource management to renewables? Well, I think、um, just over the last couple of days, I think there are several things.、Uh, talking to, to some of my U.S. colleagues,、uh, my, I mind may be a minority view, but I think that the U.S. government can learn several things from China. I think we can all learn things from China, and I'm hopeful that it works both ways. But in short,、uh, to manage resources, I think it takes a plan. As a CEO, I'm held to a plan every year. I've got to be able to deliver. I've got to execute. 
I think politicians, their plan is to get reelected. And I think as long as that's their plan, execution doesn't matter. And I think we have to enforce that execution matters. And when we do that, one of the things that China does very well is I think this 12th five-year plan, I can't think of one five-year plan we've had in the United States. We haven't gotten it right once. I don't think if you have a will in an established way, I think to the point you were making, if government doesn't lead, citizens don't really know where to follow. The one thing good about the U.S. is if the government leads and gets the heck out of the way, we'll get her done as industry and I think as citizens. And I think so the main thing that I would look for is more leadership as they have here. I think the Premier spoke, spoke very well yesterday about establishing targets, holding people accountable, incentives related to how they actually perform in the regions. How remarkable would that be in the United States? So I think there's a lot that we can learn in short. Uh, Scott, if it, I mean, Talisman's Canadian. Canada, <clears throat> Canada's political model seems to be working a little bit better than uh, the, the US model at the moment. Uh, what, what do you see as the role of government in? How, how would you want to see them involved, if at all? Well, I think, um, and I agree with Richard, I mean, listening to the Premier's speech on Wednesday morning and hearing the clear vision and um, a clear path forward on renewables. I mean, I, clearly renewables are, are going to play a large part in the future going forward. I, I think the issue right now is without a price on carbon, they don't compete with fossil fuels. Um, and that's why you need government subsidies, etc. Uh, and if you're going to make some of these moderate radical switches, you're going to need government leadership. Um, and right now in North America, and I, I think in the U.S. in particular, you've, you haven't seen the political will to take some of these uh, important steps from a leadership perspective and, and, and vision. And I think that's something that, um, you know, I'm hopeful that we can learn from, 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 from China. Mohammed. Just a, a quick comment. I've taken note of Mr. Xi mentioned that 15 percent of um, the policy of the Chinese government is that 15 percent should come from renewable energy. Compare that to America's uh, policy. Uh, by 2020, I believe, um, they want to achieve 20 percent from biofuel. This was the last administration's policy, which is being continued. So th there are different ways of looking at energy security. There are definitely common grounds, of course, but um, th there is a policy in America. It's just different from the one in China. I, um, I, I should like to stay with you, Mohammed. I um, want to move the conversation on coming back to, to food for a moment. Um, Genetically modified food, GM food, this is not a new uh, thing in many parts of the world, including, as I understand, the US. It's, it's quite common, but in certain parts of Europe, it's still looked on with, 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 with virtual horror. Uh, th there's no doubt that it's effective. Is it, does it have to be the future of food production to meet coming demand? Uh, I, I think it's a controversial issue, which is uh, a lot of time ignored. Uh, it's on the table. I mean. Um, if you go to America, you eat genetically modified food. Um, you eat it in other places also. Most of the soya that we use is genetically modified. Uh, in, in China, um, genetically modified foods are available. Um, I believe, I mean, you can push it to the limit. I understand that um, they've, uh, you can produce um, uh, milk now using cows in China that produce breast, uh, breast milk for infants rather than feeding them cow milk. Um, the science is there. Do you trust it is the question. And uh, do you need it? Um, these are issues that scientists cannot answer, but that society must answer. But do you think it, it is an essential part of growing the food production? Uh, I, or, um, or is it efficiencies? Yeah. I mean, we spoke about efficiencies in, in, in other areas, but there's a, a huge amount of waste in food still. I mean, India is a good example of how much is lost between the farm and the, and, and the shop. I think it's a matter of choice at the end of the day. You cannot force people to consume what they don't feel comfortable about any more that you can force them to, con to consume a medicine that they're not comfortable about. There is myth, there are fears which are based on reality, others that are not. Consumers in general don't trust anybody these days. They don't, got, they don't trust uh, the regulators, they don't trust uh, business, mm. uh, they trust themselves and sometimes they don't have the knowledge. So you have to deal with that. To answer your question as to whether genetically modified foods are uh, good or evil, I think they can be good. 
I think the necessity for regulation is important to make sure that we are not um, over-relying on uh, science and um, they should be challenged with their safeguards and interactions, you know, two medicines on their own can be very good for you. Together they can be a lethal cocktail. Is the same true of genetically modified foods or not? It may be irrelevant. I think people should be entitled to ask questions. Science is going forward uh, uh, anyway. But whether this will solve uh, the issue of scarcity or not, whether in the Philippines, for example, they, uh, they take rice and make it uh, you know, resilient to disease, or in Vietnam, to salinity, um, perfectly safe. They say, they claim, it's tested. The next step, wh wh where further do you go? And the more complex it becomes, who regulates? And if it's in the hands of um, recognized countries, what if it becomes available to countries that are still trying, well, you know, Libya? <laughs> you know, uh, 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 which scientists do you trust, and how, mm. how do yeah. you control it? Th these are issues that societies, they, they just have to be discussed. And I, I noticed that uh, you know, in, in many meetings on food, GM is not addressed. It's, people shy away. Uh, I think it should be brought it to the needs, surface. It needs often. a bit more light. Can I just add a, a further comment on the trust issue? I think that's a deeper issue which might not have been just covered actually at this forum here. I mean, like it's getting more and more universal. Just imagine food uh, is one, and just Mohammed was mentioning, but also actually in other sectors as well. You asked me about the partnership. Uh, what's the basis foundation for a partnership? It's a trust, right? If somehow the government doesn't trust the business, um, the public doesn't trust the government or the business or whatever, so there's no foundation there at all to talk about any trust. Yes, we can talk about innovation, talk about technology, everything like that, but really fundamentally, if that's, the trust part is missing, it's going to be really, really difficult for anyone to drive any agenda uh, in today's yeah, world. And, and to get trust, you must have transparency. Is there transparency enough, do you see, in the PPIs that are happening in China right now? Because there is obviously issues in China about corruption. Um, well, again, actually, uh, tra transparency is absolutely one of the Im very important uh, tools, actually, to increase the trust there. Um, but in the meantime, actually, uh, so there is also truth in it, right? Who do you listen to? What do you mean transparent? What's being disclosed? You know, if it's, again, actually, behind that, that there is a trust issue, there's so much information out there today. It's not like we don't have any information there, but what kind of information? Who are the people sending out the information, stuff like that? If that process is not well developed or built, I think, again, it's going to be difficult, even though you say, yes, we, we can have a transparency, yeah. it still doesn't solve the problem. Uh, yeah, I'd like to bring Mr. Shi in here. Uh, you were nodding there, but uh, is, do you think more transparency is needed uh, in China's model to, to, to make all, because there are very big plans in China, they're very impressive plans, but can it be delivered uh, under the current conditions or do you need more transparency, more implementation, more policing of, of corruption issues, that sort of thing? What's on to go? To have a fair and a harmonious society, I believe that the transparency at the government level is an absolute necessity. This is what we, the government has been promoting, and we are trying to uh, improve the transparency to make it uh, the process transparent, to make it really um, uh, to, to allow the participants and the general public and the businesses um, uh, to, to make them uh, monitor what the government, on the other hand, it's very important to create this trust system in the society to really um, improve the overall uh, uh, quality of the general public. And that is another important element in this uh, in this in the, in the process of establishment of the and uh, trust trustful society. So we need to have take both bottom up and uh, top down approaches um, to get to the uh, trustful society, and from the, uh, the the transparency should be established at both government and the corporate levels. Approach from the government down. Are you happy there is enough transparency, or would you like to see more effort being directed into opening up how the levels of government are working? 
呃，我想这也是中国政府。During the process of uh, uh, transforming the function of the government, uh, this is a target for the government. The China is still in the process of uh, transforming its uh, function. Uh, it is uh, fair to say that uh, China is uh, uh, transforming and uh, learning from other countries. At the same time, the government uh, should take into consideration our national conditions because uh, China is a special. China is uh, such a big country. We cannot uh, blindly copy the practice of other countries, we should uh, uh, apply what is suitable for China. We're rattling along at a great pace here, but I would like to ask uh, if there's anyone from the floor who would like to join the debate, join the conversation, uh, if there are any questions. If you do, just raise your hand, and uh, if you could just state uh, clearly uh, who you are and uh, which organisation you're with. At this stage, is there anyone who'd like to join discussions? Sir, over here. Flagship Ventures. Um, the renewables discussion uh, was, was uh, kind of a big part of this today for resources, and that requires innovation. And also we talked about the Premier's comment yesterday, and I was struck with uh, China beginning to think more about innovation and with a planning culture, how people would think about planning innovation. Mr. Xi, would you like to um, would you like to answer that question? How, how, with this increase in innovation in China, how do you plan for that? 那么，我想我说说几句这样一个问题，因为我。have been working with um, the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology for quite a long time. By developing the medium and the long-term development plan, we emphasize that we should uh, transform the development pattern. That is to say we will shift uh, from the resource-intensive development to the um, technology-driven development. We have identified the goal of uh, innovative country. We have uh, development uh, the policies. Um, for example, we have uh, uh, emphasized that we should uh, uh, increase the capacity of businesses in terms of uh, innovation including both the SOEs and SMEs and the private enterprises. And we have also uh, launched uh, the uh, human resources policies. For example, we have developed policies to attract overseas talents. And in the world, we have uh, uh, developed uh, various kinds of uh, plans. Under the director leadership of Premier Wen, we have organized tens of hundreds of scientists, including the scientists in economy and social sciences, to carry out the development of plans. Through planning, we have identified the measures to help us to achieve the goal in the medium and the long term uh, development plan. And uh, apart from the long and the medium uh, term development plan, we have uh, mapped out uh, uh, a five year uh, plan. We have uh, uh, formulated the plans to address the challenges in current China society. And the Chinese government will increase the in government input, and we will mobilize the private sectors. We have encouraged the development of incubators, fund and GEMs, to 
increase China's capacity in innovation. In the past 10 years, China has made remarkable progress in terms of innovation. However, at the same time, we should be fully aware that China still has a long way to go. China's uh, uh, innovation is not isolated. It's not isol isolated one. We will uh, increase uh, innovation by learning from other countries. We have uh, uh, actively participated in the international uh, plans. We have uh, joined hands with the United States, uh, Japan, and uh, another five countries to launch an uh, international plan in nuclear power development. Uh, I think Mr. Xu has pretty much uh, uh, gave the outline of the overall strategy to answer your question. That's, I think that's very well answered. I even appreciate that. The only thing to add, um, China, this is sort of about the human talents. Um, Mr. Xu mentioned actually at the national level, we do also have plans about human talents sort of plan. We even have a long-term 10-year plan. Uh, for human talents. Human talents not only just educate or train them domestically, but also really recruiting talents internationally. Uh, so just that's another thing I want to add into that process. I remember actually some of my American friends uh, a few months ago was in, in New York and we were having dinner and so we're talking about China and about China's 12 five year plan. And uh, those friends pretty much really familiar with the China, how China works. So we talked about a competition issue and a couple of friends basically said very, very frankly, say, how could we, US, compete with China? China is literally running the world's largest company, the way actually we're running this country. We pretty much plan everything actually, not necessarily perfect uh, way to do it, but somehow actually that's a sort of the way you know, the thinking actually dominating see, how we manage this country and in there R&D technology innovation is a big part of it. Thank Andrew, you. Andrew, one thing um, sitting in Canada I would say uh, we've seen a significant increase um, over the last probably five or six years in, in Chinese companies coming to Canada uh, to try and partner uh, on the resource side. So whether it be uh, in the oil sands or whether it be unconventional gas, uh, there's been, I would say, uh, a, a very big um, increase in activity uh, from Chinese-Canadian partnerships. It's just very, how, how does that work? Is that a, is that a cross-stake holding thing or is it just a, 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 an understanding? No, no it would be uh, an economic relationship. It's so, a, for right. example, there would be partnerships between um, you know, minority, typically minority partnerships where a Chinese company would own 30 percent or 40 percent of a venture. Um, the uh, Canadian or U.S. company uh, where maybe would, would, would provide some of the innovation or the learnings uh, and the Chinese company would provide some of the capital uh, with the full intent presumably to bring some of those learnings back to China. Mm -hmm. Have you, uh, excuse me, Mr. Xi, yes? I want to add that in terms of in the field of innovation, China pay great attention to the production of intellectual property rights. Uh, some foreign countries are worried that their technology will be stolen by the Chinese companies. I think uh, uh, the production of uh, uh, IPR is a basis. Uh, China is uh, improving the production of uh, IPR by um, perfecting its uh, legal framework. I think uh, the production of IPR is very important uh, for international cooperation. And China is actively participating in the development of uh, standards because uh, standards are very important uh, for uh, the industrial cooperation especially in emerging uh, industries, China want to have a more say. Uh, what? That is obviously a very hot topic uh, across all areas of industry, and China does not have a good record on that. Now, you are saying it is, it is improving. Uh, perhaps uh, Richard or, uh, or Scott, obviously this is a very sensitive issue, IPR, and China's, uh, some would say, contravention of, of, of IPR um, acts. 
Would you say there has been an improvement in IPR uh, protection in China? I mean, you may be the wrong person to ask, seeing you're in the mining industry, but uh, Phil, I'm curious. I may very well be the wrong person to ask, but I'll venture an opinion. I always have one. Um, I, from what I read and from what I've heard, I think that China is making progress in this area. I think the fact, again, that they ascribe a goal to this, that they have uh, mechanisms now to try to get there and some visibility into this, I think, are great first steps. That's my opinion, but take it as that, an opinion. Okay, okay. Um, there was a question down, down here from the floor. The gentleman in the, in the shirt, just in the second row. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Arun Sen from Lanco International. We're an energy developer, and so my question to the panel and comment is related to the, uh, the issue of what happens when China and India and other large emerging markets catch up to the West in terms of uh, per capita consumption of energy. And I think uh, your panel touched on this earlier, and I was uh, happy to hear the optimism of of uh, Mr. Bryan and Mr. Thompson, that the producers will find ways to meet the demand. Um, my, my concern actually is in terms of what happens if India or China and China, Brazil, do not catch up to the West in terms of energy efficiency of their economies. Today, in terms of energy consumed per unit of, 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 unit of GDP produced, India and China are on, on the order of three or four times less efficient than the U.S. or, or Europe. And if these countries continue to consume in the way they have, will you be able to catch up in terms of production and innovation if they don't change their policies and introduce market uh, influences to increase the efficiency of production? Uh, in, in, interesting question. Uh, two, two questions there, really. One for Mr. Xi. What is China doing about energy efficiency? Two, if it's not going to work, how do, do the producers cope? Um, I would ask you um, if you could keep your questions quite short, because uh, your answer is quite short. We are, we are getting short of time now, and I'd like to try and get a little bit more in if I can. So first of all, Mr. Xi, Chinese efficiency in usage of energy. How big a um, focus is that in China? In terms of energy efficiency, China has identified it as a priority. In last five-year plan, the Chinese government has fulfilled its uh, um, commitment to, to break down the target to enterprises and the local governments. So we have uh, accomplished uh, the goal of 20% uh, uh, energy efficiency increase. We actually, we the actual figure is uh, more than 19 percent. 19 percent. Uh, in China's uh, con energy consumption, uh, industry, uh, transportation, and uh, the government uh, as well as the utility consumption uh, occupy a uh, quite a large proportion. In the next five-year plan, energy efficiency will still be on the top of our agenda. Uh, it is a mandatory uh, target. The governments will be held accountable for fulfilling those targets. Uh, just as this uh, uh, gentleman has said, if we do not uh, increase uh, the energy efficiency, we cannot meet the demand of energy consumption. We have uh, increased China's energy efficiency. However, we still cannot catch up with the United States. If we do not use uh, increase the energy efficiency, uh, we will require several um, planets uh, on the um, demand side we will improve in the next five year plan um, uh, pricing reforms and innovation but and you can co you would be able to cope well, I, I, you know I, I think it avoids a crisis in the near term uh, 
but just innovate. I don't want to leave you the opinion. I just think you can innovate your way out of it. I definitely don't think you can. I think you're going to need uh, energy efficiency. Um, and pricing reforms is a, is a good point. I mean, I, I'm a big believer in pricing solves a lot of things. And clearly, um, we haven't figured that out uh, globally, frankly, in a, in a lot of areas. Yeah, and I don't believe, I don't have the optimism that producers can meet every need every day. I actually think it is a balance. I think Scott's exactly right. Can I, I, I would like to challenge the view. I think actually uh, this question has been repeated uh, at least in the last decade or so in my professional life, actually. That's always been repeated. The question always remains, have we solved the issue? No. I don't think if we continue to say, concerned about, say, what if per capita energy consumption from China and India will, you know, catch up with the U.S.? I don't think we, we are. We are talking about efficiency. We are talking about alternatives. I still don't. We have the way out. Rather, I would take another maybe two or three steps back asking some fundamental questions. Why do we need this energy? Why do we need, you know, where do we use them? Uh, for instance, from city management perspective, do we understand the flows of the energy, stuff like that? If somehow we could go back to really the fundamental, the basic part, understanding the needs why, all this why's, and then in that process trying to figure out what are the best or whatever the most effective technologies to deploy. I think probably there is a hope there. If we continue to ask questions like that, which we keep asking, we do not solve them, I really don't see the magic there, basically, to get out of the process. And, and I think that's a global question to ask, not just a Chinese question to yes, ask. I agree. And I think that's a perfect way to end this discussion. Uh, global questions, questions do need to be raised. We have... Uh, uh, extended our allotted time a little bit, but not too much. Um, they'll take one more question without looking at... Yes, sir, quick, a very quick one. Uh, what happened here? Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Shu, you mentioned that uh, and the uh, mid- and long-term energy plan in the Fukushima nuclear accident, uh, the Chinese government has uh, uh, has a safety review for four months. Already this exercise has come to the conclusion uh, whether this review has an impact on the uh, this uh, new approvals of the new projects and the nuclear project. Do you believe that the nuclear development of, for the 12th five-year plan period, uh, whether the uh, 40 million kilowatt target is the uh, very big uh, ambitious project uh, target. I believe that the uh, Fukushima accident is a, a huge uh, Im has a huge impact on the nuclear power industry because China is in, in the uh, uh, is is developing its nuclear power. Um, uh, and so we we do we and the, the whole industry is uh, is really affected by the accident. But on the other hand, we should say this is a good lesson to be learned. Then then we really uh, need to enhance the uh, importance of the safety uh, within the nuclear power uh, industry. We hope that in the future, when these reactors are built, we are able to meet the higher standards uh, in terms of safety and security. But still, uh, the, uh, that that could bring some impact on the 2020 uh, target. Uh, original plan is the uh, 20 gigawatt. Uh, eight, um, I believe that the, the target might be co uh, compromised, uh, and the gap should be met by some uh, clean energy and uh, some other renewables, so that the 15 percent share uh, could be uh, full, fulfilled. Uh, but still, the nuclear. Um, power as the uh, in ingredient of the clean energy uh, will continue to be developed. Uh, I will continue to tap the potential of the nuclear power. Thank you very much. I'm afraid one hour obviously uh, is not nearly long enough to do justice to an enormous topic and a topic that will s affect us in a very direct way for the rest of our lives. But uh, I would like now to just to thank our panel for uh, joining us today. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, it's been enlightening for me. I hope it's also been enlightening for the audience as well. And thank you very much for your time.